Um, I wanted to talk about the, um, the, the reforms or the proposed reforms in China and how they will, uh, how they're likely to affect the rest of the world. And I want to start off with the basic balance of payments uh, uh, formula because the way China interacts with the rest of the world is going to occur through the capital account and through the current account. Uh, as you all know, a, um, a current account surplus by definition is equal to a capital account deficit, which by definition is equal to the in excess of savings over investment. China runs a current account surplus. <clears throat> it also runs a capital account uh, deficit. That is, it's a net exporter of capital. Although most of us probably agree that the export of capital is more likely to determine the size of the current account surplus rather than the other way around. <clears throat> In most of our models, implicitly, we assume that it's the trade account that has primacy. I'm going to get into a little bit later why that's very important. <clears throat> but of course, China has an excess of savings over investment. It saves uh, more than it invests. Um, which in itself is a little bit of a surprise because China has the highest investment rate in the world. And you would imagine a country with a very high investment rate would have insufficient savings, particularly developing countries. That's usually been the case. So that investment would exceed savings and that country would, be a, uh, would have a current account deficit and a capital account surplus. So it would be a net importer of capital. But that's not the case in China. It has an extraordinarily high savings rate. And it's really important to understand why China has such a high savings rate. One of the great mistakes we make in, uh, in economics generally is to assume that uh, um, savings is really a cultural issue. Savings is what households do. And thrifty countries with thrifty households save a lot and countries with spendthrift households say very little. And that's not true at all. Um, if you look at countries with high savings rate or countries with very high current account surpluses, you'll notice that they all have, relative to their peers, a very low household income share of GDP. And that's an extremely important issue in the case of China because this is the great imbalance in China which uh, Beijing has been promising to resolve since 2007, and it's actually worse today than it was in 2007. So it's important to understand <clears throat> why China has such a structurally high savings rate. Um, when we think about the roughly four decades of, of the, what the Chinese call the reform and opening up, the, uh, the period uh, that began a couple of years after the, the death of Mao, um, we, uh, it's, rather than think of that as a single period, as a single growth model, it's better to think of it, I think, as, as sort of four separate periods, the last of which we are trying to, uh, to enter with great difficulty. The first period, of course, consisted broadly during the 1980s, these periods sort of nicely fit with decades, uh, during which uh, China underwent a huge set of what I would call liberalizing reforms. Uh, basically under Deng Xiaoping and the, uh, the, the Standing Committee, which uh, this was a very highly centralized China, and Deng Xiaoping and the Standing Committee uh, pretty much controlled uh, the country in a way that Xi Jinping still does not control the country. Um, but during that period, they implemented a whole series of reforms that consisted of removing the constraints that prevented Chinese uh, workers, and, and I, I can't call them Chinese businesses, there were technically no businesses back then, but Chinese economic entities from behaving in a productive way. And of course, when you remove all of those constraints, you immediately get a burst of growth, and that accounts for much of the growth during the 1980s. But um, beyond that, that's not enough. When you've, when you've unchained an individual, uh, he will run faster, but that's only a one-off thing. What do you need to do to continue to keep growth rates very, very high? And there, China implemented a, a growth model, which is not particularly unique. In fact, it's a growth model about which we know a great deal. Literally dozens of countries since the Second World War have implemented forms of this growth model. Uh, and, and this has always resulted in what we can call an investment-driven growth a miracle. Um, and they have, uh, they have two features in common. 
that are very, very important. And, and uh, I refer to this as the Gershenkron model because it was Alexander Gershenkron that really explained how this model is supposed to work. Gershenkron noticed that developing countries uh, have very high investment needs, of course, and for a variety of reasons, they tend to have fairly low savings. Or to the extent that they have savings, those savings are typically already invested in non-productive assets, gold, silver, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, which means that developing countries are dependent on foreign capital, which is a, a very risky and irregular form of, uh, of, of uh, investment. So Gershenkron's point was that in order to speed up development, you had to force up the savings rate. And I'll get back in a minute to how you do that, because China did that more successfully than any other country in history. Um, the second point that he made is that the private sector does a pretty bad job of investing in infrastructure and in long-term investments, so you need to centralize the investment process. So these are the two fundamental points of the Chinese growth model, and it's something that we've seen in lots of other countries. Uh, you, could, you could say that the Soviet Union almost invented this model, uh, but we saw it in countries like Japan and a number of Latin American countries in the 70s, uh, Japan in the 1980s, uh, and, and on and on. <coughs> now, how do you force up the savings rate? Well, it turns out that conceptually, there is one very easy way to force up the savings rate, and that is to force down the household income share of GDP. Why is that? Because GDP is equal to consumption plus savings. So high savings just means low consumption. And most consumption is done directly by households. Uh, government does some consuming on behalf of households, but the, by far, by far, most consumption is driven by households. Businesses don't consume. So if you can reduce the household share of GDP, then you will reduce the consumption share of GDP. And if you reduce the consumption share, by definition, you're increasing the income share, uh, the saving share of GDP. That's all it is. That's the trick. Um, I, a few weeks ago at a, a BIS conference, um, an investor um, uh, spoke about uh, rebalancing the Chinese economy, and he said, look, it's really not very hard. For every $100 of income that a Chinese worker makes, he saves $50. And all you have to do is convince him to save less. The savings rate in China is roughly 50% of GDP. That is completely wrong. Um, what really is happening is that for every $100 of GDP a Chinese worker produces, he gets paid $50. And out of that $50, he saves somewhere between 10 and 15 and consumes the rest. And when you add up the uh, uh, government consumption, which is roughly 10% of GDP, 10 to 15% of GDP, that's how you get the numbers to work. Savings is roughly 50% of GDP. Consumption is GDP minus savings minus the current account surplus, so it's somewhere in the high 40s. Um, that means that if you want to reduce the savings rate of GDP, then you've got to increase the household income share of GDP. Uh, this is extremely difficult to do, and it's difficult to do um, because of the way that reduction in the household income share uh, occurred. So over, over this period from basically the early, the early to mid-1980s, which is when this process began, until around 2012, when it bottomed out, it started to rebalance, but very, very slowly. Um, we had a number of factors that effectively transfer wealth from the household sector to uh, other sectors. Uh, it ended up being the borrowing sectors, which are uh, mostly large companies in the government. <coughs> and how does this work? There's a lot of ways this works, and I won't go into them because it's not uh, uh, necessary for this, uh, for this particular lecture, but the most important way in which these transfers occur was through a hidden tax on household savings. Um, how does this tax work? Well, during the last decade, it was particularly severe. Uh, during that period, nominal GDP growth was roughly 16 to 20%. I'm talking about the first decade of this century. 
And um, the uh, GDP deflator, which is not terribly accurate, but it's the best measure we have of overall inflation in the economy, was somewhere between 8 and 10 percent. Um, what would an appropriate uh, lending rate be in that sort of environment? Economists would have huge arguments about it, but we would probably end up somewhere between, let's say, 12 to 14 percent as the right lending rate in that, in that sort of environment. It certainly should be above the inflation rate. Well, <clears throat> in fact, during that period, um, the lending rate, the prime lending rate, was during the first half of the decade 6%, and during the second half it was 7%. And the benchmark deposit rate during the first half of the decade was 2.5%, and 3.5% and during, uh, during the second half. So you can see the problem, you can see how that implicit tax works. Um, uh, uh, if you saved money, at the end of the year, you had a little bit more, 103 uh, a quai for every 100 you saved, but the value of that was significantly less. And that represented basically a transfer from net savers, who were the household sector, uh, to net borrowers, who were large businesses and the government. Uh, because of that transfer, uh, when I first started writing about this uh, uh, maybe 12 years ago, I did a very rough back of the envelope calculation. And I calculated that between 5 and 8% of GDP, it's a huge number, were transferred every year from the household sector to large businesses and borrowers, just in the form of very low interest rates. Um, at the time, I think there was a lot of controversy about that argument, but uh, it's become pretty much accepted. And then both the World Bank and the IMF did their own much better, much more sophisticated calculations about the amount of the transfer. And the World Bank came up with between 4 and 8, and the IMF came up with 5%. So we're all in the same ballpark. This is a pretty big transfer. And the result was that while GDP was growing at roughly 10% during this three-decade period, 9 or 10%, the uh, household income was also growing very quickly, but not as quickly. It was growing at around roughly 7%. So what's the result? The result is that the household share continuously contracts. But of course, if somebody's share contracts, somebody else's share must expand. And that was basically borrowers, which were large companies, many of them state-owned enterprises, and mostly local governments. <clears throat> so what we've seen in China until 2012 was this continuously contracting household share. But the economy was growing so rapidly that household income was nonetheless also growing very rapidly. Um, meanwhile, somebody else, large companies and, and businesses, their share of the economy was expanding. So while China was growing at 9 or 10%, they were growing faster, 13, 14, 15%. Wild households were growing at roughly 7%. The result is this huge imbalance in, uh, in the distribution of income. The household income share of GDP is, uh, if you exclude one or two Arab oil sheikdoms, where it's very hard to make the calculations, uh, the household share of GDP in China is probably the lowest ever recorded. So it's not a surprise that China has the highest savings rate in the world. That would be inevitable. And as a quick aside, uh, this argument applies to lots of countries. If you look at Germany, which used to have quote-unquote low savings before the Hartz reforms in 2003, and then became extremely high savings, and ended up running enormous current account surpluses, we often hear about the thriftiness of the uh, German people. But household savings didn't change. What changed is that the Hartz reforms lowered wage growth so that uh, the household share of GDP in Germany contracted. And as it contracted, not surprisingly, German savings went up. Not German household savings, German savings. <coughs> so it's a pretty common thing. When you see a current account surplus, instead of saying, my, those guys are thrifty, the real, the real thing you should be saying is households are getting a very low share of what they're producing in that country. That's why the savings rate is high. But anyway, to return to China, <coughs> um, is this a problem? Is this model a problem? <coughs> 
Well, it's, it, it's incredibly successful at accumulating savings and directing those savings into investment. So under what conditions is this a, gro a good growth model? Well, obviously, it's a good growth model when a country is severely underinvested. <coughs> and it is relatively easy to figure out where investments need to grow. After 30, 40 years of Maoism, which of course followed the Civil War, which followed the anti-Japanese war, <coughs> China, not surprisingly, was very seriously underinvested for its level of development. So this uh, model was exactly what the doctor ordered for China. You accumulated vast amounts of savings and poured them into investment. And as you did so, Chinese grew very well, very healthily. Excuse me, I have uh, asthma, and every once in a while I need to... People always wonder why I live in Beijing. <coughs> um, by the way, the air this year has been pretty good. Uh, they really did change it. Uh, but anyway, so to go, back to, uh, to go back to China, as long as you are significantly underinvested, this is a great growth model. The problem is, once you've sort of maxed out on your investment needs. Now, many people will argue that China is far away from maxing out because investment per capita in China is, uh, I don't know what the latest numbers are, one-fifth, one-eighth of what they are in the US. <clears throat> now, this is another implicit model that is wrong when you think about it explicitly, and that is the, the idea that the right amount of investment for every country is equal to that of, of what I call the capital frontier. You take the most advanced economy, the US, <clears throat> you look at investment per capita, and you say that's the goal we should all strive for. Um, I don't think that's right. I think every country has its own optimal level of investment based on the institutions that determine how productively workers can use resources. Legal institutions, financial institutions, bankruptcy law, maybe cultural institutions, all these other things. A country is poor not because it doesn't have enough bridges. It doesn't have enough bridges because it's poor. And by that I mean it doesn't have the right institutions that allow it to be productive and a, a rich country. So in a case like that, the optimal amount of, of capital for China is much lower than it is for the US. We don't really know where it is, but it is much lower. And in theory, once China <coughs> reaches that level, then what it should do is a new set of institutional reforms, reforms to the financial system, the legal system, and everything else that then allows workers and businesses to be much more productive with the resources they have. Um, by the way, every single country that I can find, and I'm a history junkie, I read everything, but every single country that I can find that followed this growth model ran into the same problem. At some point, it seems to have maxed out in the uh, amount of investment it could absorb. But rather than change, rather than move to a new model, <coughs> it continued investing. And so what ended up happening is that at that point, debt starts to grow faster than debt servicing capacity, which is the definition of an unsustainable increase in debt. Um, why do countries never stop when they should? Why do they continue investing well beyond their needs? Um, uh, one of my favorite economists, Albert Hirschman, who is not read at all in, in Asia, I think largely because he wrote about Latin America, but he really should be more widely read. <coughs> he asked that question in the 1970s, and he said it's not because we don't realize we're overinvesting. He said the problem is that the groups that benefited disproportionately from the very rapid growth are extremely powerful. The more successful the growth model, the more powerful they are likely to be. And these groups uh, prevent the country from switching the model. Because, as I will get into later on, basically the type of reforms that you need involve a retransfer, rebalancing of the wealth income. <coughs> so these groups, after many years, of receiving a disproportionately high share of a rapidly growing economy, now need to shift if you do it correctly, and they pay a disproportionate share of the adjustment costs. In other words, they must get a disproportionately low share of a much more slowly growing economy. And what Hirschman argued is that these so-called vested interests are the ones that prevent the, the necessary reforms, the right kind of reforms. <coughs> 
Um, I say everyone in China should read them because it's widely recognized now that this is exactly the problem that China faces. Um, uh, why is that? Well, once you reach the point where your investment is no longer productive enough to justify the investment, where your debt servicing costs are rising faster than your debt servicing capacity, then of course your debt burden is starting to grow. It's interesting that every, again, every single country that followed this growth model ended up with a significant debt problem. And, and the problem was resolved either in the form of a crisis or in the form of one or two or even longer decades of very, very low growth. A classic case is perhaps Japan. Um, <clears throat> so if you, uh, uh, at some point, you have to recognize that debt has become a fundamental problem with the way the economy works and you have to reduce the growth in debt. But remember that the reason debt, the debt burden is growing, is because of huge amounts of money poured into non-productive investment. So if you're going to reduce that, then you're likely to see a surge in unemployment, unless you can get another source of demand to replace this uh, non-productive uh, investment. What are the sources of demand? Well, um, for many years, uh, People said, well, it's not really a problem. What we have to do is change the way investments occur so that we are no longer investing non-productively, but rather we are investing productively. Well, uh, that's easier said than done. Um, the amount of change that the financial system requires to do that seems to be more than any country has really uh, ever been able to absorb. <coughs> the only country that I can find that managed such a significant change in the financial system was uh, Chile at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. But remember what drove that. Um, a, a terrible economic crisis, which saw a signif significant contraction of the uh, Chilean economy, and every single bank in Chile went bankrupt. It takes an awful lot to change the financial system to the point where it is no longer channeling resources into the areas that it typically channels them to, channels them to uh, and it starts channeling them into productive areas. Uh, so I was always very skeptical that China would be able to do that. And in fact, I think by now people have given up on that. It's quite difficult to do. That doesn't even bring in the question as to whether there is enough productive investment. Um, it seems like there's always enough productive investment, but if you look at the private sector in China, they don't seem to act like they believe there is. The private sector, it's hard to get the data because some private sector investment is oriented at projects, non-productive projects uh, funded by the government. If someone's going to build an unnecessary airport, it still makes sense for you to uh, provide the services or provide the, the, the things that are needed to build the airport. That sort of private sector investment uh, uh, is, is ultimately non-productive. If somehow you could subtract that, Private sector investment in China is growing at a negative rate. It's actually contracting. But even that, uh, uh, I think, overstates the, the real attitudes of the private sector in China. They do not act like there is a huge amount of productive investment that needs to be met. So even if there were some way of transforming the financial system, which I want to stress is extremely difficult and has never really been able, uh, never been accomplished except under terrible, terrible conditions, but even if they were able to do it, it's not clear that there is enough good productive investment that it can fully replace this massive amount of investment in non-productive assets. So what other kind of demand can you get? Well, if it's not investment, it could be the current account surplus. That's a source of demand. Uh, but China is way too big for the current account surplus ultimately to drive growth. Uh, and that's not even considering the very... Uh, 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 weak global environment. So finally, there's only one source of demand left, and that's consumption. And it is now widely recognized in China that you have to raise consumption. You have to keep consumption growing very, very quickly, even as you bring investment down. That's the only way to prevent a significant rise in unemployment. And by the way, it doesn't have to be one for one. Although we often think of China's comparative advantage as cheap, disciplined labor. In fact, that hasn't been China's comparative advantage. It's true that labor in China has been cheap, 
But for most of the last three decades, capital was free. In fact, it was better than free. It had a negative real cost. So not surprisingly, Chinese growth has been extremely capital intensive, uh, much more so than for a country at its level of development. Um, demand, uh, 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 employment driven by consumption, tends to be much more labor intensive. So in theory, this is just very theoretical, you could shift from investment to consumption and accept much lower growth rates without seeing a significant increase in, uh, in unemployment. But how do you get consumption up? Remember that uh, consumption in China is very low because the household share of income is very low. Uh, so if you want to get consumption up, you have effectively to transfer, sort of reverse the original transfers. You have to transfer wealth from the, those who benefited most, local governments, SOEs, uh, and the elite, both directly and through their control of the ownership of local government assets. You have to reverse that process and transfer the wealth to the household sector. Now, um, again, for a long time, this was a very controversial argument. But I think by now it's widely accepted. And if you look at the, um, the, uh, um, the third plenum in October 2013, in which they set up the major reform proposals for, uh, for Xi's presidency, you'll see that almost every single one of the important reforms involves, directly or indirectly, a transfer of wealth from local governments to the household sector. You strengthen the social safety net. Uh, you provide uh, unemployment benefits. You spend more money on education, on medical treatment, et cetera. Those are all transfers. <coughs> so it's understood what you have to do in China to rebalance the economy. If you want to address the debt problem, you, there's two things you need to do. One is you need to pay down the debt. That's a whole other conversation. But no country in history that I've ever found that it had an excessive debt burden has ever been able to grow its way out of the debt. It doesn't grow until it starts paying down the debt. And it can do so by defaulting and restructuring it with a haircut like Mexico did in 89, or inflating away like Germany did after the First World War, or through financial repression, or squeezing workers and using the proceeds to pay debt, which is what uh, Ceausescu did in Romania in the uh, 1980s, etc. There are many ways you can do it. But one of the fundamental things that China has to do is to deleverage, that is to get debt servicing capacity to grow faster than debt servicing costs. And I will only deal with this very briefly, but once you go through all the different ways of doing it, uh, reducing debt is simply a question of allocating the cost to some sector of the economy, and that sector has to be local governments. I won't explain why, um, because I really want to talk about the other big issue that China faces, which is to slow down the growth in the debt. And if you want to slow down the growth in the debt, um, you have to uh, increase consumption as you're reducing investment. And the way to increase consumption as you're reducing investment is effectively to transfer wealth from local governments to the household sector. So that even as you're closing down these projects uh, and, uh, and building fewer airports, et cetera, rather than fire workers, and again, this is very theoretical, I'm assuming, heroically, that this can be done smoothly and without all sorts of disruptions. But I'm doing that just to show you how hard it's going to be in the best of cases. <clears throat> As you close down all of these investment projects, you need consumption to go up quickly enough to absorb all of these workers. Now, how do you turn a steel worker into a hairdresser? I'm going to assume that you can do that easily. But of course, it's not that easy. Um, uh, so how do you bring up consumption as you're bringing down investment? Well, you've got to bring up household income. You can temporarily increase consumption without increasing household income by the expediency of increasing household debt. And that's what's been happening in the last three years. Three years ago, one of the things people always said was China really doesn't have a problem because if you look at the indebtedness of the household sector, it's very, very low. And because the US problem and the European problems were, seemed to have been triggered by very high household debt, then it follows, it doesn't, but this is the argument, that the reason you have a debt problem is because household debt levels are too high. And Chinese household debt levels are very low. 
I used to tell my class three or four years ago that the two unexploited areas of debt left in China were household debt and external debt. And I hope to God that they wouldn't exploit either of them. <coughs> uh, so far, they've, they've done a good job of exploiting household debt. It's grown so quickly that if it continues at this rate, within two to three years, China will have as much household debt as the US did before the crisis. But that's not sustainable. You can increase consumption rapidly that way, uh, but not only is it not sustainable, it doesn't solve the problem. <clears throat> the reason you want to increase consumption is to lower investment, and the reason you want to lower investment is to reduce the growth in debt. So if you have a growth in household debt, you're not solving the problem. You're simply transferring the growth in debt from one sector to another. And ultimately, all Chinese debt is the same. It's all ultimately government debt because it all goes through the, uh, through the banking system, which is uh, pretty much insolvent. Um, but since that's not sustainable and it's not the right way anyway, uh, that means you do have to affect these transfers. Uh, now, here's the problem. In March 2007, <coughs> then Premier Wen Jiabao gave a very famous speech in which he acknowledged that China does indeed have a tremendous problem of imbalances. Um, until then, and it's astonishing to me that we had this debate, but there was a ferocious debate about whether or not China, China was significantly imbalanced and that was a problem. Uh, so finally, when Premier Wen acknowledged that the, uh, the, the economy was deeply unbalanced uh, and that this was a serious problem, uh, that resolved that debate. He also promised that it would be the top priority of Beijing to rebalance the economy. In the end, they didn't do it. Uh, the imbalances continued to deteriorate, in fact, at a faster rate than ever, right until uh, roughly 2012, when it finally bottomed out and has slowly started to rebalance. The household share is slowly growing, um, much too slowly. But to me, what's really interesting about Wen Jiabao's speech is I've been living in China since 2002, and we had never heard of the so-called vested interests. They didn't exist in China. Um, ooh, I'm very, very close to the end. Uh, the, the vested interests didn't exist in China, and um, uh, everybody's incentives seemed to be aligned in the same direction. Uh, but after that speech, within six months, I really wish I had kept note of this, I didn't, but within six months, we started to see in the People's Daily and in all the other uh, Chinese newspapers, the phrase vested interests. And in China, what vested interests means is that these very powerful groups, usually at the provincial level, that have prevented the government from implementing the reforms it wants to implement. This shouldn't surprise us. This is exactly what Albert Hirschman would have predicted. Once China began the rebalancing process, we would see the emergence of tremendous opposition uh, to this rebalancing process. And uh, whether or not the, the, the country was successful in rebalancing was really a question about whether or not it was sufficiently powerful to overcome, uh, overcome this opposition. Um, and that's really been the story of China. <coughs> in 2010, uh, my students at Peking University, it's the top school in China, so I'm very lucky I get these amazingly bright kids. Um, we put together an optimal rebalancing, an optimal adjustment for China. Now, an optimal adjustment from an economic point of view involves a financial crisis. That's the most rapid way to rebalance the economy. But of course, that creates social and political problems that China might not be able to absorb. So we assume that that was not optimal, that China had to avoid a crisis. So one of the first things that we said, uh, and my students understood this quite clearly back in 2010, is that if you look at the history of countries that have attempted to implement these types of policies, it's very difficult, they usually fail. But the successful cases tend either to be robust democracies like the US in the 30s, or highly centralized autocracies like China in the 1980s. So the step one in, in, our, in our recommendation was that the next leader had to centralize power dramatically. And I don't need to tell you, that's exactly what happened. The anti-corruption campaign is about the centralization of power more than it is about anything else. Um, so uh, uh, to, to finish quickly, where do we stand? 
Well, it's turned out very difficult for the president to implement the necessary policies, assuming that they understand them, and I believe they do. There's a lot of reasons for that. But it's been very difficult to implement, and they haven't done anything. <clears throat> That's probably not unreasonable. They had to centralize power sufficiently if there was any chance in hell that they would be able to implement these policies. And that's the great importance of, uh, of the 19th Party Congress last year. In it, we believe, the proof is in the pudding, and we haven't seen it yet, but, uh, and in fairness, it's too early to see it, um, but we believe that the president has sufficiently centralized power that he will now begin to implement the necessary reforms, which ultimately consists of two important steps. One, reduce leverage by assigning the cost, the debt servicing cost, to local governments and the elite, probably just local governments. So local governments have to liquidate their assets and use the proceeds to pay down the debt. And two, to increase consumption by increasing household income by transferring wealth from local governments to the household sector. Those are the two things we have to watch for if the president will have been uh, successful in the reform programs. And I would argue that it's really over the next year that we should start to see real implementation of these programs, if they, if they indeed occur. So I, don't, I think I'm out of time. Uh, so we won't really have time for questions, but thank you very much.